Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all. Um, for those of you um, who don't know me, my name is David Hewan, and from all of us at Garrett Publishing, it's a delight that you could join us today. Um, I'm just letting people in as I go, so excuse me. Um, before I introduce Father Richard Leonard, and indeed hand over to him, there's some important items, if I may. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I join you from. I pay my respects to the Wurundjeri elders, past, present, and emerging, and I extend this respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait people from the many communities who may be with us on this Zoom today. Uh, today's Zoom um, will be recorded. There are a number of people who are unable to join us but did register. Uh, we'll have this video up on the Garrett website in coming days and we'll send you a link to the recording um, as quickly as we can. On entering the Zoom today, your microphone may be muted. If not, please ensure your microphone is muted. Um, for all of those of you who are familiar with Zoom, there is a chat function available um, and Charmaine from the Garrett team is here today to assist me in helping with that chat function. We'd welcome any questions you have. So please note these in the chat function and we'll endeavor to have Richard respond. We've allowed some time for, Chris, uh, for questions after Richard's address today. Richard Leonard is a Jesuit priest. He has degrees in arts and education, as well as a master's degree in theology. Father Richard uh, graduated, uh, did graduate studies at the London Film School and has a PhD from the University of Melbourne. He is an honorary fellow of the Australian Catholic University, has been a visiting scholar with the School of Theatre, Film and Television at UCLA, and a visiting professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He directed the Australian Catholic Office for Film and Broadcasting, for our friends at the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference for 22 years. He served on the jury of Cairns, Venice, Berlin, Warsaw, Hong Kong, Montreal, Brisbane, and the Melbourne International Film Festivals. And he's lectured on faith and culture all over the world. He's been widely published, not just in Eureka Street here in Australia, but in America Magazine, in US Catholics. He's a regular col col columnist in the London tablet, uh, and he's a regular guest on the ABC. He's the author of 10 books. Among the titles are Where the Hell is God? What Does It All Mean? A Guide to Being More Faithful, Hopeful and Loving. Hatch, Match and Dispatch, A Catholic Guide to Catholic sa uh, to Sacraments. And the most recent book, The Law of Love, Modern Words for Ancient Wisdom. Father Richard will become the parish priest of North Sydney uh, in December 2021. So congratulations, Richard, and all the very best with uh, what will be a wonderful tenure as the parish priest, and, uh, a very vibrant and wonderful group of people. Um, now, Richard, that's your cue. Um, to lead us today and um, thank you so much for joining us. Not at all. It's a great honour and a great joy for me to be with you and thank you very much uh, for coming today. I um, uh, want to get straight to it and talk to you about where um, the law of love actually came from. And actually, it really came out of Pope Francis and somewhat in the year of mercy. But initially, it came out of a negative reaction. I was um, somewhat horrified that there were some uh, faithful and wonderful Catholics and Christians that I knew who sort of thought that poor, uh, that Francis's uh, take on mercy and compassion and love as being the fundamental 
uh, building block of uh, Christianity seem to be novel or different or gone too far or soft on the essentials and all of this sort of stuff. So I must admit, I was sitting on that for years, uh, just incredulous that their own sense of um, uh, of what, in fact, was the fundamental bedrock of what we believe and why we believe it, um, why, why we could come to such completely different ideas about that. And, um, and in, in the end, I just decided that I was going to do so much. I wanted to do something about that. So rather than take them on, I really wanted to go back to first principles and have a look at, at in, indeed, this fundamental idea. Because the reality is that Jesus not only overturned centuries of religious belief and images about God in giving us the law of love, but it is really just the most demanding and the most challenging teaching. Love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. On this hang all the law and the prophets. Now, some people balk, and I say this in the introduction to the book, some people balk at the word law and love being used in the same sentence. Um, it is true that Christianity broke away from um, following a book of rules, from the Torah and all the Levitical laws, for instance, as being needing to be scrupulously followed, only because we had Christ, we had a relationship that guided all our choices, determinations and decisions, and, and indeed our duties. But that this um, law of love was meant to be reciprocal. It wasn't one way of us just following slavishly what Jesus said and did, but actually um, it was meant to be um, this reciprocal gift of love and then finding life and life to the full. But for the moment, I want to stay with the book of the rules or the laws. To be honest, um, I used to think that, uh, and I used to say sometimes in my preaching and teaching, um, that we were people of the book that the Jews, Christians, and Muslims are people of the book. I said that a lot, I think. And uh, I, in preparation for this book and in reading and also in conversation, it was in fact a uh, wonderful Islamic um, uh, scholar, Daniel Madigan, an Australian Jesuit, who um, kept reminding me, or he was the one who really told me that in fact, we, we are not people of the book, we're people of a person. And the quote, I love this quote, the divine word is the energy vibrating with everything that has ever been created. And the language God has chosen in order to speak the word most fully is the language of our own flesh, body language, we might say. Now, that was a revelation to me. That's still a revelation to me. So rather than saying, oh, we're like the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians, we're all people of the book. I get why we say it and the commonality of our heritage, our spiritual heritage. But actually, we're not people of a book. We're people of a word made flesh, of somebody in the person, in the body. And that's actually a dramatic thing to believe. And it's also a huge departure. Furthermore, Pope Francis has uh, sorted out or moved on that who is my neighbor to include the creator and order as well, Adate C being the most or the longest. But more recently, he's talked about um, how uh, creation is the poorest of the poor of the poor in the world. And I like Martin Atkins in all of this regard says that, um, you know, we're not meant to be salespeople for the gospel. He's a Methodist theologian, a Methodist minister in the United States. And I just saw this in an article he wrote. I came across it by sheer um, chance. But he said, we're not called to be um, salespeople for the gospel. We're called to be free samples of it. Now, that's a wonderful idea. I love images. I love metaphors. I think, in fact, people think visually. That's one of the reasons I love parables and stories and uh, metaphors and visuals, because people think visually. We're free samples of it. We're giveaways, loving giveaways of God's body language. So to assist us in reclaiming that, love is the absolute big insight of the Christian tradition in and through Jesus Christ. I went back to first principles. This book has a look at the Ten Commandments, the Transfiguration, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself in uh, the three, Matthew, Mark and Luke, and 1 Corinthians 13, that love is kind, love is patient. And I had a look at what does it mean in six of those chapters to for that love then to take root in us? What does it mean for us to be free giveaways of it? We haven't got time to go through all of those tonight. So I just want to um, uh, think about how we could, in fact, apply this when we actually apply it, how we could change the world. So I want to go to the, the great commandment, as it's called, to love God, love neighbor and love ourselves.
The problem with the word love, uh, the problem for us is in the word, in the ancient world, there were seven definitions or seven different words for love. Three came into the Christian, four came into the Christian, Christian tradition, eros, storge, philia and agape, ludos and pragma and filiatia. Um, they, they're not used, but um, there are seven different words and we've tended in English to bring that down to one word, um, love everything, which is um, the ancient world, I think I think it had it right. They were much more uh, descriptive about the different types of love and what it might mean in its application. So we've got to be able to find, I think, a, a refreshing of when we use it, how we use it and why. The big one that Jesus tells us, of course, is to agape God, neighbor and self. It's the highest form of love there is because it's sacrificial love. Now, the word sacrifice, I don't know if you know the etymology of it, but um, it comes from two Latin words, sacrum facere. Sacrum, sacred, you can hear it, sacred comes from sacrum, um, and so holy. And facere is to do, so to do the holy thing. Now, often when we've heard about sacrificial anything, it's always about pain. And sometimes the loving thing can be a painful thing to do. But actually, I think in its richest manifestation, it's in fact a holy thing to do, a whole thing to do. I like that. I like to recover the etymology, which might give us a better insight. And um, when we come to love God, love our neighbour, we must recognize from the word go that doesn't come from our own initiative it comes from what god is already doing in us um, one of the eucharistic prayers says um, you have no need of our praise yet our desire to thank you is itself your gift um, well we could say our desire to love you is itself your gift so the fact that some of us love god is already a gift god has given us to be returned let's think about love of god I love this line from Marcus Borg. Uh, if you haven't read this book, it's really worth reading. He was a Protestant New Testament scholar, died a couple of years ago. He's in the USA. Tell me your image of God and I will tell you your theology. The images of God that we have and the image of God that some people carry for a lifetime tells me everything I need to know about how they talk about God, what they say about God and how they act. I've come to see that some people believe in a tyrant. They have a tyrannical God. Some of them are bishops, priests, brothers, nuns, lay people, leaders in the church. And the image of God, at least that they convey to me, is one that's fairly tyrannical. Not true of Francis, I'd have to say. I'm critical of him in other regards, but uh, I think he's one who has been um, generous and encompassing and trying to open out this discussion much more. And the God we actually believe in held nothing back in loving us, that we talk about the kenosis of God emptying God's self in Jesus Christ. And I came across this line that God was, uh, Jesus was God's love letter to the world. Now, that could be um, a bit twee, but actually, I've, I've grown to like it more and more that Jesus was God's love letter sent to the world. First class, uh, don't return to sender, um, express post, and on it goes. God communicated in the body, in the flesh. And we believe Jesus' full and true divinity didn't obliterate his humanity. So he's not putting on a show as a human being. So uncompromisingly loving, just and sacrificial in the way that he lived within the bounds of his humanity. And that's the way God chose it. Um, and Jesus holds nothing back from us. Morris Duffy, uh, the uh, religious educationalist who died sadly many years ago now, the great Bendigo priest, Morris Duffy once used to, used to say often, how far will you go, Jesus of Nazareth? I will go to the end until they know how much I love them. I will go to the end. So, for instance, as you know from my other books, I have a go at people who say Jesus came to die. I think we've got to totally revise um, atonement theory. I, I think it's been, at least as it's been baldly presented, I think it must be much more nuanced if we're going to use it at all. But Jesus didn't simply come to die, he didn't come into the world to die. Last I checked, he came to live. And as a result of the way he lived, he threatened the political, social and religious authorities of his day that they executed him. And that's the whole point of Good Friday. We find God confronting evil in Jesus Christ, head on, staring it down. And then what's God's response to us, humanity, killing Jesus on Good Friday is to raise him from the dead, that death be no more, and that we're invited to life and life eternal. So 
uh, God's response to uh, Good Friday is Easter Sunday. That doesn't mean Good Friday doesn't matter. Don't hear me say that. I think Good, matter, Good Friday really matters because we believe a God died. We believe a man rose or a human being rose. There's nothing extraordinary about a human being dying. And there's nothing you would think about a God rising. But we believe that it's true in the opposite expressions as well, which is quite phenomenal and extraordinary and life-giving. There's the love of God, the God we have. The love of neighbour, it's not about a feel-good factor. It's about changing the world so that everybody might know compassion and mercy everybody that nobody is beyond god's love and compassion um no one and that's quite stunning to believe that quite extraordinary to believe it it's um so generous so all-encompassing and in the year of mercy when francis you know it was a great gift in a world given over to revenge francis comes along at least to the church and says we need to recover mercy and compassion as the first thing and he said one of his lines a quote unquote is, wouldn't it be good if the first thing that anybody ever encountered in a follower of Jesus was mercy and compassion? That's a great challenge because so often they encounter judgment or that they don't belong or, you know, that they've got to get better or get good to get God and on it goes. So what we've got actually is uh, that mercy and justice is the first moment. Now, telling people, Jesus telling people to love their enemies, because he goes further than just love your neighbor. In each of the Gospels, he goes on to say, not only love your neighbor, but love your enemies was quite something. Because let's just say Israel at the time didn't like their enemies very much, and they had very good reason not to just quietly. So I list many of their enemies. They loathed them with a passion, including the despotic, dreadful occupying Roman army. And even yesterday with the centurion, you know, these stories in the gospels at mass, fantastic. These um, never found faith greater than the centurion. But in relation to the love we're supposed to have for our neighbor, Jesus rejects the law of retribution, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for foot, and replaces it with a love that is merciful and forgiving. So he rejects the law of retribution I think some of us, me included, have to go some way about that. I think uh, backsliding is uh, what evangelical Christianity talks about. People can backslide to, back to bad patterns. And every so often I can be uh, given over to a bit of retribution or a little bit of revenge, where in fact we're called to be merciful and compassionate. Um, and this has an application, as I go into some detail in the book about this, that we're invited to love the relative we won't speak to, the former spouse against whom we poison our children, the neighbour we delight in annoying, the work colleague we badmouth because they got the promotion that we are after. It's a tough call. None of us can pretend that the love and forgiveness of a neighbour, of a brother, a sister, of a fellow religious, of a priest, of a bishop, of anybody, of another parishioner is easy. It's really difficult. In fact, I think some of the most difficult people to love and forgive and be compassionate towards are in fact those with whom we live. And then the love of self. The love of self has had a disastrous history in the Christian story. Um, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it's an imperative that you can, in, if you follow that logically through, you can only love your neighbor to the degree that you love yourself. And the problem is that we've got it horror. We have had it horribly confused over the centuries between love of self and adoration of self. Jesus didn't say adore yourself. He said, love yourself. And while we're there, he didn't, he said, die unto self, not killed self. And there's a world of difference between those two moments as well. So when we love ourselves, we don't adore ourselves. Adoration of self puts the world at uh, me at the center of my world. And the personal pronoun is so revealing. I'm an old English teacher, as you may be able to tell. But the personal pronoun is so revealing. My life, my parish, my mass, my time, my everything. The little my and me and uh, I, the old personal pronoun is very, very revealing and how we use it and, uh, and why we use it. So we're not meant to be the center of our own universe as, as love, lovable as we are, but then we can actually move out towards others and uh, die unto self, not kill self. Um, and everything rever revolves around that as. Um, we're not meant to treat other people as our inferiors on the one hand, 
or allow others to walk over, over all over us on the other. In a section I do on forgiveness in this book, I talk about how it's very hard to forgive people who will not um, take responsibility for what they've done or said. They say something never occurred or they don't want to even talk about what the events were. They're very, very difficult for people to forgive, very difficult, because they'll take no responsibility for what's happened. Even then, we're called to forgive them because forgiveness is a gift we give ourselves more than it's a gift we give anybody else. But whatever of that, when we do forgive people and when we do love people, that doesn't mean that we have to keep lining up to be done over by them. Love of self doesn't mean that you keep getting yourself into a position where someone can treat you despicably or dreadfully. Claiming love of self as the cornerstone of the gospel leads to good boundaries, appropriate good boundaries. And there would be some people in my life that I've had to put some boundaries around because when I'm around them, I'm not my best self. When I'm around them, they're not particularly nice to me. And when I'm around them, in fact, what I end up saying and doing is not what I want to say or do. So it's not the most loving moment in the world. So what does Christian love, self love look like today? Self love look like today. Firstly, I think we've got to care for our body, not worship it. I think once we see the cult of the deity go down in any civilization, and I do a little bit of this in the book, um, going back and the Olympic tradition is actually part of that whole movement. When the deity's on the way down, the body's on the way up. Now. We, we actually say that the Holy Spirit comes to take residence within us at our baptism. So we're called to care for our body. We can't bash up our body and say we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So what we eat, what we drink, what we drugs we take, what uh, whether we go and see a doctor, whether we, you know, all the things that are associated with an appropriate care of the body. But the appropriate, uh, the good distinction I think I make is we're not called, we don't worship the body. And sadly, there can be a bit of that cult of worship right now. Our self-care, I think, has a number of different elements and just a few. Reducing anxiety, being joyful, being active in mind and body and heart and spirit. And I think to be grateful. I think gratitude, as some of you know, I write about this a lot in my books, um, primarily because of my sister's accident and uh, where she became a quadriplegic. And that made me so grateful for the smallest things in the world. Just the number of things we take for granted, even in lockdown, even in these terrible times. We aren't so, we should be so grateful for so much even then. But being joyful, you know, I'm against the happiness industry. I think there's a whole cult of happiness right now, which is not very helpful. But I think we should be joyful. I'm sick of parents saying, I don't care what my kids do as long as they're happy. Now, I don't know why parents say that, because they're setting their kids up for a fall because I'm not sure about you, but not every day of my entire life has been deliriously ecstatic and happy. Um, but I do want to be joyful. I want to be a person of integrity and love and hope and goodness and truthfulness. And I think that's going to bring a lot of joy. And so I think we should be careful of the happiness throwaway line, because sometimes these lines have a habit of taking possession of our expectations. And I think we're seeing a fallout of that right now. But being joyful, if you're a happy Catholic, a happy Christian, can you please tell your face about it sometime soon? Catholics and Christians are some of the gloomiest people I have ever met. Apparently, we've got this joy and joy of, of, to the full and life eternal, but we're not telling anybody about it. And I think it's part of that self-care of trying to be people of passion so that we know where we've come from, why we're here and where we're going. That should put a spring in our step to enable us to be the most joyful people we can be. And our blessings, I hate it when people say we're lucky to be Australians. Well, uh, if you've actually read Donald Horne's book, you'll know that was a sardonic title, The Lucky Country. Actually, he was having a go at us. He was being a bit sarcastic in that title. But we took it on board as though he was praising us for what we should rejoice in. Well, I think I'm very proud to be an Australian most days, not every day. But I, I don't think I'm lucky. I think I'm blessed. And when your blessing goes up, so does your obligation to share. So when we say we're deeply blessed to be Australians or indeed to be Catholics or Christians, we're deeply obliged to be Australians and Catholics and Christians because we have to share the blessings we have with those that we come into contact with. And then what I want to do in being grateful is to praise those and thank others um, who are in my life.
Sometimes um, some Christians and Catholics I've met are very stingy with praise. It's almost as though they're going to run out, um, but they just don't want to give too much away because we're going to get a big head or they need to be brought down a peg or two. Or This is horrendous thinking. And so far from the great law of love to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. We've just got to make sure that when we do thank people and we do express our gratitude, we do praise them, we're sincere about it because insincere praise and gratitude gets us to nowhere. Finally, the place in our lives and the context in the world is to change it for everyone. Love of self properly understood empowers us to change the world. So this gift we receive in the gift of faith um, is in fact then meant to change the world. And all of us are called to do that either through small ways or larger ways, depending on time, talent, situation, opportunity. Um, just being kind to somebody today, having a kind word, that could be a lovely way to, um, so it doesn't have to be big and grand, although sometimes for some people, it is going to be big and grand. And sometimes we've got to hold certainly our elected leaders to the big moment because they're making big decisions. So we're called to be as merciful and loving and just as we can in the world, for the sake of all God's children everywhere. So in conclusion, the law of love, modern words for ancient language, I hope, well, I think it is, a reworking, a revision, and a reclaiming in modern language, filled with stories and applications and examples of how the Ten Commandments, the Transfiguration, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, love of God, love of neighbour and self, and 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind, love is patient, love is gentle, enable and inspire us to be the best free samples or loving giveaways of God's body language, Christ, that we can possibly be in and for the world. If you've read the book or if you're reading it or if you hope to read it, I hope that's just a bit of a taste of what's there. And uh, as David rightly said, we wanted to leave most of the time now for any comments or questions or anything that I can clarify um, or maybe open up anything else that might be in the book for you. I hope that's at least a taster from which you might think it's something that you could enjoy. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very, oh, look, all, all those happy faces are back again after Richard's PowerPoint. Thank you very much, Richard, but we can see everybody and there's lots of smiles, which is, um, uh, which is good. Um, now, uh, if anybody has some questions, um, they may wish to either raise their hands um, or throw a question or comment into the chat function and we can share those with Richard. Um, but I was going to ask um, Richard, particularly in the times of COVID, um, uh, we're getting very, very frustrated with our neighbours, um, not necessarily the ones just over the fence, um, but we are getting very, very frustrated, I think, um, as a community, uh, as a multicultural and multi-faith community um, of the situation that we find ourselves in in either Melbourne or Sydney. Perhaps this isn't so relevant for those in the West uh, or the South, um, but how how can we how can we best manifest that that law of love um, mm. if we are so much in lockdown as such? Thanks, David. Let me deal with that in two parts. Firstly, those who want to say God is sending COVID in some way to teach us something or to even up the score, or um, you know, this is part of uh, God's uh, plan um, or will for the world. Um, I can deal with that one more quickly and more easily. Um, I think that's rubbish. Um, I think that uh, when we come, there are parts of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, where God is, remember that everything that uh, everything in the Bible uh, are from pre-scientific people. That's not their fault, but they didn't understand how pestilence, how uh, rain, floods, um, when they won a battle, lost a battle, everything was given a theological reading. They're pre-scientific people. Um, and so when people say, oh, well, you know, this, the plagues were sent to the Egyptians. Well, I think we've got to unpack the plague story very, very carefully, actually. 
Um, and I'm sure those plagues did occur over a very long period of time and were given a theological reading and then uh, compressed into a rather neat little uh, let my people go story. Um, and thank God it did have a good outcome and the Hebrews do get set free. That's a good outcome. But when people come along and say that, you know, AIDS was doesn't God doesn't like gay people. So said AIDS and God is trying to tell us up right now. That's just nonsense. And so I think we've just got to say it. Um, because in Jesus Christ, Jesus doesn't send a plague. Jesus doesn't send a, um, he doesn't rain down, um, uh, um, you know, pillar of salt. He doesn't turn people into a pillar of salt. He doesn't send an earthquake. He says, forgive your neighbor, pray for those who persecute you. If they ask, want to walk one mile, go to one, one cloak, give them a second. All of those things, um, incredible. Um, that's, and we say to see Jesus in action is to see God definitively in action. So the theological side of the discussion I can uh, deal with fairly quickly because really there's just no evidence in the New Testament uh, that, um, and they were pre-scientific people as well, but um, there's no evidence there that uh, Jesus keeps up the tradition of sending things to punish people. That seems to, um, Jesus not only came to fulfill the Old Testament, in part he came to correct it. Now I know our Jewish brothers and sisters don't like us saying that, but it is nonetheless true. We do say to see Jesus in action, to see God in action. The second part is with your neighbour, your neighbour um, more directly, are those who won't get vaccinated, those who will not uh, do social distancing, won't wear masks, who continue to party and gather, even some Christians who are going to gather for church services, even some Catholics who um, say it just doesn't apply to me. Um, the, the problem is the more you yell at people, the less they listen to you. So I guess we've got to get to that moment where we try and respectfully disagree with one another as best we possibly can. The best way I've encountered the really angry person who disagrees with me theologically after mass or after a conference talk or after a seminar or workshop or whatever, sometimes writing back to me after a book I've written, um, is to keep asking them questions about why they hold what they hold. Firstly, establish what they hold and find whether any points to agree and then secondly, um, why do they hold what they hold? Why would they? And I do find that that is more helpful to try and do it as calmly as you can. You've got to have a bit of time for this. That's the problem. Um, and But simply saying, well, you're wrong or you're ridiculous or, you know, that doesn't change minds and hearts. Um, telling people that they're ridiculous, that they're stupid, that they, you know, if only you knew more, only confirms that some people in the very entrenched position that they have. So I guess we've got to do it as patiently as we possibly can, even with, I'll give you one really practical example. Um, we decided in our Jesuit churches that we weren't giving communion on the tongue during the COVID thing at all. Now I had some parishioners at North Sydney who are absolutely committed to that. So, you know, they would come and just stand there as a bit of a detente, you know, like I would be standing there not wanting to, like when you think about that, if that person was infected or if I'm infected, there couldn't be a worse moment. Whatever one might think about sacramental graces, um, uh, building on nature, the nature could be very frail indeed. So I tried to have conversations with them. Now, in almost all cases, except one person, I was able very with with conversation and respectfully trying to understand what where they were coming from to get them to see what that there was a this was a limited period of time they could go back to what they wanted later but for the moment they needed to see the common good took precedence over their personal position there was one person who was impossible so i said well look we just have to take a decision here and i'm sorry but your individual needs are not greater than the common good of the whole so you either can't receive Holy Communion in this church, so you may have to go somewhere else. But that I didn't want to get to that, but in the end, you that we have to. But I want to try a number of other things before we get to absolutism and to exclusion. But maybe with some people, that's the only place we're going to get to. But to respectfully disagree as best we possibly can. Mm -hmm. I promise my answers won't be as long. No, no, no. Um, I noticed that uh, uh, Francis um, has a hand up. I'm going to unmute you because I think you've got a question. So if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you, you have the floor, Francis. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Richard, for our, our wonderful presentation. 
you know, as you were talking about the great commandment, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And then you went on a little bit to talk about, you know, how to uh, to love uh, our neighbor. But there are so many people in this life who actually have no self-respect. They cannot love themselves. So that concept can be quite difficult. Could it be better if we say, love your neighbor just a bit more than you love yourself and in that way they'll learn to love themselves it is a big issue in mm. a huge group that i work with richard so i'm not being funny or smart yeah. uh, a, a, a whole group of women who uh j just don't like themselves mm. so for them they'll say well you know if i've got to love my neighbor as i love myself i'll tell you what I won't like them very much because I don't like myself very much. Right. Uh, thanks, Francis. That's a that's a really good uh, question and good challenge. I, I think everything I say when I work with teachers, everything we do for self-esteem of kids is at the heart of the gospel. And sometimes you can people who are cynical about this, uh, like every child has to win the prize, everyone comes first. Well, I don't think we need to go there, but I don't want to be cynical about it either because we're trying to build people up. We're trying for them to... Um, have the very best self-esteem. So all the women, the wonderful women that you work with, every single thing that you do and they do for one another to build each other up is at the heart of the gospel. So this, um, because sometimes we have an inflated sense of love, um, you know, the, the, this love has got to be all encompassing, all great. Actually, I often think it comes down to kindness. I talk about this in the book, um, sometimes the word love gets in the road because we've powered it with so many heavy emotions and big experiences, and understandably, and sometimes it is. But I wonder whether actually just being kind to one another, being kind to yourself. Um, and sometimes I, I don't think, I think there are two things we haven't um, theologically explored as richly and uh, as broadly as I think we could. The first is kindness as a cornerstone of the law of love. And so I developed that in the book. Um, we tend to say it to kids, be kind to one another, because, and as a result, we've tended to think that kindness is infantile, but I think there's nothing infantile about kindness. I think it's an unbelievably mature and adult thing. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. If, 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 is what I'm about to say a kind thing to say? And what I'm about to do a kind thing to do? It's, you know, if you put the word love in that sentence, it just gets a bit overloaded a bit too strong. But if you put the word kind in there, it, it comes down a bit and becomes much more practical. And so with the wonderful women you're working with, when they hear love neighbor as yourself, maybe being kind to themselves is the place to start, give themselves an even break, you know, letting themselves off the hook. And then they discover they can be kind to other people, kind to um, give somebody else an even break and maybe forgive somebody else. Um, so I think that's, so kindness is a way. The other thing uh, I want to say is, and I developed this in the book too, is um, the theology of friendship. Now, Catherine Lacunia, the great feminist theologian who sadly died many years ago, um, she wrote a part of a book, so I can't say this is original. Um, she wrote a part of a book uh, called, I think it was called Models of God or and, and some name like that anyway. And um the last chapter was God as friend. And again, given that Jesus talks about it, I call you friends of, you know, a slave doesn't know what the master is doing, all that sort of stuff. Um, this friendship was at the center of certainly the Joannine uh, preaching of Jesus. Um, I love that idea. And I like, I think it's unexplored that uh, to be a friend of Christ's and not, not, we have explored it, but I just think we could um, claim it a lot more. So being a good friend to myself, being a good friend to somebody else is another manifestation of the law of love. Because you're absolutely right. Sometimes that language can be so highfalutin that in the end people feel, well, it's impossible because I just don't can't do it. So we need other language. That's why the subtitle of the book is um, Modern Words for Ancient Wisdom. Trying to find, and you've just helped me. I wish I'd had this conversation before I wrote the bloody book. Um, that uh, then, you know, trying to find other language can then get into unpack that in a way that's much more helpful. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm just looking at some comments and some questions. So I'll just go to the question first from um, iPad Fran Egan. Now I tell you, I've heard some names in the past, but iPad Fran is the first time I've heard that one. But uh, she's asking um, in your book, 
do you expand more on the people of a person rather than people of book? Hope the seven types of love go further. Looking forward to reading it. Okay, I can deal with that fairly quickly. Um, I um, develop um, the seven, I, I certainly go through uh, the meaning of the ancient world and how the Greeks use the seven different types of love and what they meant by it, but the book isn't about that. So it, uh, if you went there wanting a chapter on that, it wouldn't be, you'd be um, disappointed. Um, but I do develop that how all the way through, because it's one of the great insights, I think, for the book, that we're not people of a book, we're people of a person. Mm -hmm. And once you take that on board, then I think that's actually revolutionary in theology. And I just never, maybe everybody else has heard this very clearly. I must admit that when I, I seriously uh, came to write this book about we're all people of the book. And it was only a conversation with Dan Madigan and then reading some of his stuff. And he's in dialogue, of course, with Muslims, um, uh, great Islamic scholar. scholar. Um, it was in that conversation that I was able to say, well, my God, we're, we, we don't believe in a book. Uh, even a person of love becoming a person. So I certainly develop that and, and then give lots of examples of how we might do that. Um, so I hope um, uh, I may disappoint you if you wanted more on, although there's lots of stuff online about those other seven meanings of love and what it means. Somebody asked a very similar question to that, uh, David. Um, from Lismore Diocese, they said, uh, That's Peter, correct. Uh, asking if he agape him and Peter responds with him, Lord, I filiate you. Filiate you. Um, Yes, he does it once. There is the there is the um, the two different types of love there are used. Um, but Jesus asks three times agape, and Peter says once, I think, filio. I'd have to go back and check my Greek New Testament for that, so don't hold me to it. But whatever it is, it's a sacrificial. Filio is um, the love of a brother, um, uh, so the filial love, um, love of a family, which is incredible. But agape was where you're going to lay down your life for someone. And you could do it for a brother or sister. It doesn't exclude. These were not exclusive. A whole lot of these were like, you know, um, agape and eros for husband and wife. You can have erotic love, um, which is wonderful and good. And you can, but you would put your life down. And in the sense, the marriage, the marriage brow vows bring that together in the most extraordinary way. Um, fantastic. So it's where Jesus keeps coming back to the sacrificial love. But as I say, I think the word sacrifice needs a little unpacking because we've always heard it as fairly, um, uh, not that it won't cost us something, but it will be painful and it'll be difficult and demanding and you will lose yourself entirely because of it and will you be obliterated. It can, there can be a violence behind some of its application over the time, which I'm not sure is helpful now. I think there's enough violence in the world. I think there's enough violence in relationships. And I think we need to, sometimes we will give over ourselves. We will go beyond. I think of parents for sick kids, for instance. I've seen heroic examples of parents who would do the most extraordinary thing for their sick child. Now that's the sort of sacrificial love, the agape, which I think we're called to. Yep. Thank you very much, Helen, um, for that question. Um, uh, Joss, uh, has a question as well, Richard. How do you think that the Pope being a Jesuit helps his message to us? Um, <laughs> well, um, that's a book in itself. That's a book in itself. And in fact, it's one that Paulus Press want me to write. Um, and I am, I am resisting it. There's a whole industry out there on Pope Francis books. And, um, and uh, I'm resisting writing it, to be honest. Um, uh, couple of things. Firstly, uh, there's no way that you can understand uh, Francis without understanding, not necessarily the Jesuit thing, but Ignatian spirituality. He is so deeply steeped in Ignatian spirituality. So for instance, um, you know, he doesn't have a problem holding um, difficult conversations together. It doesn't have to be one or the other, because Ooh. Ignatius um, uh, while Ignatius could be very clear once discernment, discernment had taken over, but he didn't want to foreclose on discernment. He didn't want to say at the beginning, well, let's start a process of discernment. Now here's a document that tells you all where we should get to. Um, Ignatius wasn't like that. He did in the end take decisions and he thought leaders should lead and that they should stand and be counted. He had no problem with that, but he thought that that was the end of the process. And then, so the spiritual exercises, um, the uh, spiritual, the, the rules for the discernment of spirits, 
um, and the constitutions of the Jesuits, the three great documents that Ignatius Loyola gave the church. Um, they deeply have formed him and you can see it in the way that he exercises his governance as well. There are many people who would say that this is the first Jesuit Pope we have ever had in our history, and it will almost certainly be the last that they would like to see as well. I'm actually hoping there would be one more. I was hoping to be the first Jesuit Pope, and now I'm going to have to be the second Jesuit Pope, but I'm going to be the first Pope Dick the first from Toowoomba. And um, I think that will have a certain ring, a certain cachet about it that might live on in people's memory. But I think the Jesuit thing, um, a, a couple of really important things. Firstly, um, I think poverty, chastity, obedience um, has really shown in the way he he's a man who's very committed to this preferential love of the poor. And this was big for the Jesuits after the Second Vatican Council, uh, the late 60s and 70s. Some of you may have heard of Father Arupe. Father Arupe mm -hmm. was the general of the Jesuits for 25 years. And he called the Jesuits to this preferential love for the poor. And, and Francis is still there. Francis is, and rightly so. Um, and he also saw that the vow of poverty wasn't about being poor because that's something we're trying to eradicate. It's a really badly named vow. It's a vow of simplicity. And it's about holding the things of the earth and holding one another in an appropriate way. Um, using those things we can and should use, but always seeing what are the implications of that. So I think his vow of poverty really, of, of simplicity, really kicks in. His sense of obedience, remember the word obedience, obidare, uh, in Latin, come, you know, it's the first word in the first of the religious order rules that we have still a copy. Well, the Desert Fathers and Mothers had rules, but we don't have a copy of them. We have some descriptions of their life. But Benedict is the first rule that we have. And the very first word in that uh, rule of St. Benedict, and I know we've got a few good Samaritans with us right now, because um, I saw earlier, but uh, you know they know better than I am, is listen, obudare, listen. So the vow of obedience is not jump and you know he says jump and then the church just asks how high. It's about, are we all listening? And how are we all listening? And is that listening, um, and let's get rid of the things that stop us from listening. Firstly, primarily to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, primarily to God and Christ. Secondly, primarily to the cry of the earth and the world. And then also then the cry of our own heart. So he's big on that. And then um, chastity, I think those, that vow kicks in too, because it's about right relationships. And for him, this is a pope who keeps coming back to the relational rather than the genital. And, you know, like, you know, who am I to judge? In one phrase, he sort of started an entire conversation about respect and dignity for gay people, for God's sake. Well, that's a good thing because it comes back to a human being. But way apart from what we do with our genitals, and okay, let's have a discussion about that for gay people and straight people and, and trans people and everybody in between. Let's do that. But let's see that before this are relationships and people and dignity, um, and that that's the, that's, that's the first thing to establish in the conversation. So I do think actually his Jesuit background, his religious vows, um, uh, certainly his Ignatian spirituality um, is, maybe I do have a book in, in me about Francis. I don't know, maybe I do, I'm writing it as I speak. So um, we'll think about, I'll think about that. But I, I do think it's a really good question. I think uh, whether it helps, uh, because the question was, does, does being a Jesuit help his message? I think it helps wonderfully. I want to concede right up front, there are a few people who think it helps not one jot. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the enemies of Francis. And this book comes out of it, I said. And to be perfectly frank, I'm, if we get a very conservative Pope in the future, I'll be very interested to see, you know, like what, it's all bets are off when you don't like a Pope. So if I didn't like, I'm not, you know, I was publicly always very loyal to Benedict and to John Paul II, and rightly so. I never criticised them in public. I never ripped into them. I never said they were sort of, you know, their election was invalid. Um, they were the Antichrist. Um, all sorts of incredible things that are being said. I'm amazed at this. And so I'm looking forward to if we, you know, have a swing back, which often pendulums swing, then I think I will give um, as much loyalty as some people in the church has given to the present Pope, because apparently that's the way new tradition of, for, of, of being very loyal to the See of Peter. 
but I don't mean that. I just, uh, that's me at one of my worst moments. Thank you, Richard. I've got Glenn has had his hand up for quite some time. Luckily, it's a uh, virtual um, hand because otherwise he would have had got very tired by this stage. Glenn, would you, um, uh, are you, un unmute yourself, because I suspect I have, yeah. you have a question or a comment. And welcome. Oh, I, I have, thank you. Um, I'm a, in, in education and um, in the Catholic school. I've been for 27 years, which Richard's been to, a tutor in St. Joe's and a tutor. Oh, uh, great. But, yeah, well. Yeah, I remember you freaking out because we're all in beanbags one day when you turned up and, and couches and other things. Um, but my my question is, um, I think for, for adolescent people and people going beyond adolescence, um, I think the human relationship with God through Jesus is, I guess it's the point of contact. It's the, the thing that they um, grab to. And um, often when I'm delivering at retreats and things with them, um, I talk about the story as this, this, this human person had such a huge impact on the world that for 2,000 plus years later that we are still um, hearing the stories and, and resonating with the stories. And they seem to relate to that. Um, and I wonder if that needs to be more promoted in, in general, I guess, in general conversation, that the, the God is in Christ, but the Christ is in human existence, and that um, generally our world doesn't think like that. It, it's, it puts things into, or it segregates it. These are gods, um, therefore, they're, um, I guess, examples of what the world could be, but not likely to be. Mm. Uh, Glenn, thank you very much. That's a really good question, a very challenging one, and well done on being on religious education for 27 years. My God, I, I taught year 10 RE last period Friday for three years of my life at Saviour College in Melbourne. I have done purgatory on earth. Um, I, there are no purgatory for me, I can tell you I've done that. Um, so, but I, I love teaching IRE and I still love teaching, but I mainly work with teachers as you know now. Um, a couple of things I wanna say, Jesus was like us in all things but sin. Um, so when we say, and I want to unpack that just a little bit, because I think I might have something to offer. The word sin is now so heavily loaded for so many people, whether they're inside or outside the church, whether they practice their faith or they don't, they've walked away from belief or not. The word sin is so loaded that I think it's, it's not all that helpful. And the better word, I think, these days is destructiveness or destruction. And that really helps me unpack that Jesus was like us in all things but destructiveness. Jesus wasn't destructive of himself. He wasn't destructive of other people. He wasn't destructive of the world. That what sin does is destroy. And kids get that. If you stand there and say, well, Jesus and the catechism, you know, stop the RE syllabus will say that these days. You know, he's like us in all things but sin and straight out of St. Paul and fair enough. And it's uh, absolutely um, heartland of the, our belief. The problem is the word sin. They don't hear that in any way that is helpful. So the word destructiveness. So when we say that Jesus like us in all ways, but sin, he wasn't destructive. I think that can be helpful. Secondly, then, his humanity then, as Irenaeus said, is uh, the glory of God is humanity fully alive. So Jesus is a fully alive human being. Um, they've tended to talk about, um, you know, Karl Rana talked about him being an integrated human being, the most integrated human being. Um, and so a person who lived this humanity, um, Ioannes Metz, in that beautiful little book called The Poverty of uh, the Spirit of Poverty. Um, only, you know, it's like The Old Man and the Sea by Hemingway, these tiny books that are profound, uh, really worth reading Ioannis Metz, M-E-T-Z, if anyone would like to chase it up. The Poverty of Spirit. Jesus lived his humanity excruciatingly. I love that. I think it's in the book, actually, that Jesus lived his life, his humanity excruciatingly. So there's a commitment to our cause. 
and then you're so I love the fact that you're telling these kids about um, you know Jesus and and the manifestation of God in his humanity because that's true to see me is to have seen the father I do nothing on my own the father and I are one so when we see Jesus in action he's not play acting he is manifesting in human form what we say we now believe about God so we don't have nasty God the father in heaven lovely Jesus and the bird that's sort of as rich as the Trinity gets for a few people. We say that to see Jesus in action is to see the Father and the Spirit in action, that they create together, redeem together, and uh, inspire uh, together as well, make holy together. Um, and then the second part of what you said, I think is stunning too, um, is that we're meant to be Christ in the world. And of course, the alto Christus in um, Latin, you know, to be another Christ, often referred to a priest um, at sacraments, but actually it was used in the earliest church, uh, certainly by Athanasius and Augustine, talked about how by virtual baptism we're all alto Christi. So we're all meant to be other Christs in the world because we've been baptised in Christ. So we're meant to take those values, applied as they have to be to situations right now, into the world. But a few stand out, like Paul said, they're faith, hope and love. So we're meant to be faithful, hopeful and loving in uh, Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, fidelity and self-control. Another list that can be a bit helpful. And love is kind, love is patient, love is gentle, love just is not boastful or conceited, doesn't look for the, um, the uh, downfall of the other. Hopes all things, trusts all things, endures all things. Well, it's a pretty big list and a very high demand. Um, but they're good goals to have. So we've got a few unpackings in the New Testament of what that ultra Christus might look like. What does it mean for us then to manifest that in our daily lives? But that we are meant to be Christ in the world, um, the, the other Christ. I'm not saying we're the son of God or we're not saying we're the word made flesh, but because of our baptism, we are another Christ in the world. I love the old um, line of, you know, um, you know, the old statue, I have no hands but yours that was blown off and someone put around it, I have no hands. So you're apparently a true story from Rotterdam at the end of World War II, a statue of the Sacred Heart. And, you know, I love the, the, the line that says, um, my life might, might, might be the only Bible that some people will ever read. My justice and joy will be the only sacrament they will ever celebrate. Now, rather than see that as an ongoing burden, I just take it as an opportunity to do my very best today. So to be an altar crystals. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, um, thank you Glenn, for that question. Um, I'm very conscious of time. We uh, indicated that it'd be about an hour. Um, the chat has uh, slowed down. Hey, David, there was one more question from um, Carmel, I think. Carmel? Is there one more I've missed? I'm sorry, Carmel. And if I could take it really quickly, I'd do it. No, yep, okay. absolutely. They're saying it's okay. Fine. All right. It was, it was a clap. Sorry, not a question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. It was an applause, not a, a hand up. Sorry about that. Thank you to the Cowans there. Um, and lovely to see your faces as always. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased you were clapping anything. That's great. I'm delighted. <laughs> um, 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 thank you very much, Richard. I, I, I can't help uh, after this evening, this afternoon or early evening, um, I can't do anything but help reflect on the teaching of Pope Francis and the way he's re-articulated that central message of Jesus as, as, uh, uh, as mercy and compassion and, and, and love. Um, um, I think um, uh, the law of love, is um, a must-have text for anybody waiting, uh, wanting a, uh, a wise and intelligent guide on the journey of Christian love and faith. Um, and Richard, I want to thank you. Um, and I think, I, I think there's many people on the call that would thank you as well for this evening. Um, you have a unique ability to be faithful, pastoral, provocative, um, uh, consoling um, all at the same time. So um, thank you very much, future Pope Dick. Yeah. Um, so we'll start using that. Um, <laughs> look, uh, I, I would encourage and please, please, please support Richard's work by visiting Garrett 
uh, publishing or garrett.com.au and purchasing a copy of his outstanding new book. Alternatively, contact your local bookstores and support them. In these COVID times, local bookstores need your help now more than ever. And if they go, we often find that um, we don't know what we've lost until we've lost it. So please support your local bookstores if you choose to support Richard's work and buy his book. Um, please consider buying local at all times. Um, for those of you who may be in the United States, and in fact, we're going to send a copy of the video to our friends at Paula's Press in the United States. So a very warm welcome um, a little bit late, um, but a very good buy um, from down under um, to our US friends. So contact Paulus Press to buy the book or your local bookstore. Um, with that, um, again, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for giving your time today. Um, uh, all of us at Garrett Publishing and all on the Zoom call, really thank you um, and wish you the best. To everybody out there, wherever you may be um, around the country, whether you have some uh, freedoms um, or you're locked down, regardless, please stay safe and well. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Garrett event we hope to bring um, to you soon. Um, your support is very, very much um, and graciously appreciated uh, by myself and all our team. We can't do what we do without you. Um, and uh, please go with God. Many blessings. Good evening. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Right. Thank, Thank you. you God David. Bless. Thanks Thank much. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Richard. God bless you. Bye. Bye, bye. God bless everyone. Bye. Bye. God bless everyone. Bye. Blessing. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>